and I'm taking this, this piece off right here. And uh, pop this off with a screwdriver here. Hi, and welcome to Car Corner. My name is Richard Saxton. I'm the coordinator of the automotive programs here at the Community College of Philadelphia. In today's episode, Dan Reed is going to help you see clearly how to repair your windshield washer system. If you have any questions about the automotive program, please check us out at the website. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we're going to be talking about windshield wipers, windshield washer systems, windshield wiper motors, and windshields. It's one of those things that you don't really think about very often until, of course, it's raining, at which point you probably wish you had taken a little bit of time to make sure that you can see clearly in bad weather. Compounded with nighttime or perhaps uh, snow or sleet or something like that, being able to see out of your windshield is incredibly crucial to making sure that you can see safely while you drive and you can avoid obstacles. So let's take a look at the basics first here. First of all, the most basic component we have is our windshield wiper. Now this is what I would consider an old fashioned wiper at this point in time. But this for many, many years was pretty much the gold standard of the automotive industry of what they called a windshield wiper. It's made up of actually several complicated components. Um, what we have is we have a rubber, which really isn't 100% rubber. It's more uh, probably some nylon and some other components. If it was made up out of pure rubber, like some of the older wiper blades that we used to use, it gets destroyed by sunlight and oxygen, ozone. There's a lot of ozone in our atmosphere, and uh, over time, it causes the wiper blades to actually break down. Now, we've made great strides in chemical technology and advancements to make sure that does, that doesn't happen as often. Even still, wipers wear out. Materials uh, that fall against the windshield, leaves, dirt, dust, sand, whatever, fall in between here and actually start to dull this knife edge. Now this knife edge works like a squeegee to wipe the windshield clean each time that you move by. The rubber by itself can't do the job. The windshield's curved and therefore what we need is we need to have a type of suspension system. This is actually a spring-loaded suspension. Um, so that way as the wiper moves across its travel on the windshield, it's able to change its design as it moves across the curve of the windshield. That way it always has full contact area with the windshield regardless of what position it's in on the windshield. Um, an example of a blade that doesn't change shape might be if you ever go to a gas station and you use their squeegee to clean your windshield. Um, you notice it takes several passes with that squeegee and it doesn't always really curve around the windshield well so you kind of have to go back and clean it up. We don't have that problem with windshield wipers because they're able to move. After that we have what's known as the wiper blade frame which is the part of the suspension components that hold the entire unit together. Now this thing, like I said, worked great for many many years and some car manufacturers still put them on the cars but the fact is is they're falling out of favor. There are some tragic flaws with this design. First and foremost, it's fragile. It bends and twists real easy. So as soon as you encounter some type of blockage, maybe a piece of snow or a piece of ice on your windshield in the wintertime, this entire assembly gets bent. And once it gets bent, it's very difficult to put back straight. Once it's bent, it doesn't follow the curvature of the windshield anymore, and it does a very incomplete, partial job of actually making sure the windshield is clean. So, that's strike one. Strike two is the fact that because of its actual shape, this, believe it or not, actually creates quite a bit of wind resistance on the vehicle. Now, it might not be a lot per vehicle, but compounded over millions of cars driving millions of miles a year, it's actually a whole lot of fuel that's wasted because of the wind resistance caused by windshield wipers. That's actually a huge problem. In fact, some wiper blades actually have a spoiler built into them to help deflect the air over the blade and also act as a way to push the windshield against the actual glass as you're driving faster so that way the blade doesn't pick up. When this is in the upright position, wind can catch the underside of this design and lift it off the windshield, in which case it starts to chatter and skip the faster you go. 
That's strike two. Strike three, the last and final flaw of this design is that snow and ice get packed up in here. When snow and ice get packed up in this blade design, the suspension doesn't work anymore and it stops cleaning the windshield. So you have to get out every so many miles and clean the ice or snow out of this design. So this design, we don't use it too often anymore, like I said. Um, you can still buy this design. It's fairly inexpensive, and at this point, it's considered the cheapy wiper blade, um, and manufacturers still make them. They did have one nice feature, which was that on some designs, you could actually slip out just the rubber piece and replace the rubber piece with these two little silver pieces right here, which are spring steel. Out of this design, you could, on some wiper blades, not sure if I can do it with this one or not, you could actually pull the wiper blade out of its housing. Try to pull this out here. See how that comes out like that? You could actually remove the entire wiper blade and just replace the rubber piece and keep the frames. That was a great cost savings because it only cost a couple bucks to actually go through and replace the rubber and you kept the frames. The problem is, is the springiness and again if it gets bent it has the same problems it had before. So this is the older style design. What we have today is what's known as an aero style wiper or a mono beam wiper. And you notice this wiper doesn't have the suspension system built into it like the other one, but it still is very flexible. What this uses is a piece of spring steel on the inside to actually flex and act like just a spring rather than an entire suspension. The great advantage of these guys is that, first of all, they've updated some of the rubber material. And you notice this has a bit of a silvery look to it. And it's because it's actually been embedded with Teflon, graphite, and other materials by the manufacturers. And what this does is this actually helps the wiper not get degraded by sunlight and oxygen like some of the other wiper blades. So these actually last longer on the vehicle. They also kind of have a little bit of more of a self-cleaning effect. And because the tension is very even across this blade at all points, they do a fantastic job of actually making sure the windshield is clean. Another advantage is it has a spoiler built into it. So the spoiler helps push the windshield against, um, pushes the windshield wiper against the glass and prevents it from lifting up under times of high speed driving. Also, we don't have the area for snow and things to build up in it. So it's a winter blade as well. So this blade really uh, pretty much trumps the old style design. And this is what comes on most newer vehicles today. And um, you might be tempted to go back and put these on the car, but you'll find that if you go back with this style design, while they may cost a couple dollars more, the fact is they're gonna last a lot longer. That leads me to another uh, point of discussion, which is how often should you change your wiper blades? Some people think that they should be part of the car forever and ever, and the fact is, is they wear out. They wear out, they're made out of you know, materials that are exposed to the elements. They're like tires, they wear out over time. Generally speaking, you're gonna look at somewhere between every six months to generally change your wipers. I like to change mine in the fall, and then I change them in the spring. And uh, yeah, it can be a couple bucks, but the fact is, as far as I'm concerned, being able to see clearly at night in a rainstorm is pretty much priceless. I wanna make sure I don't hit anything while I'm driving, and I certainly don't wanna be aggravated by having that smeary blob right in the center of my vision no matter how you drive, it always seems to be exactly where you have to look. One of the things that kind of confuse, uh, tends to confuse some people, is sometimes wiper blades come with directions. And people get a little freaked out at this because when wiper manufacturers make up the directions, wiper designs have changed over the years. And what we have is we have different types of mounts for the wiper blades depending on the age or design of the vehicle. Now, while manufacturers of the car would love for you to come back to the dealership and buy their specific wiper blades made for your specific car, the fact is, is most people generally go to an aftermarket retailer, buy whatever seems to work for them, and then they try to put them on. The thing that most people encounter as a problem is that they might not have the style arm on their vehicle that is designed for their blade, so what the blade manufacturer does is they include, generally, some small adapters, okay? Now to put these adapters on is not a big deal, but generally, sometimes you have to take a look at the directions to understand exactly how these components come off. Um, this particular design, you'll notice there's two small holes here. Um, you can move this arm slightly forward or slightly backwards, and what that allows you to do is position it so it's positioned properly on the hook of the wiper arm. 
Other designs, like this guy, this is for a completely different style design of wiper arm, and this piece right here can just snap right on like that, and then that's ready to go. So you have to make sure that you do spend a couple minutes and read the directions to make sure that you have the right type of wiper blades for your car and that they're going to mount properly with the right size arms. Okay? Let's take a look and move on and we'll take a look at some of the components of the actual wiper motor system. Let's take a look at a wiper motor system and how it generally functions. Now what I have here is a very simplified version. This is pretty much an old school system, but it gives most people a good idea of exactly what's involved with how the wiper system works and how it functions. First of all, we have a switch, and this can be either located either on the control surface on the, on the, off the steering wheel or on the dashboard. And with this design, this, this design has an off, a low, and a high speed. Now, for many, many years, that was pretty much the standard of all cars came with until we had things like intermittent speeds, which meant the wiper could be set by the driver depending on the amount of drizzle that hit the windshield. So the wipers didn't go too fast, they didn't go too slow you could set them yourself. The other piece we have is the wiper motor and I'm going to get more into this when we're on the car because there's actually an entire transmission built into this unit that actually moves the wiper arms back and forth. But what I wanted to show with this design was that of course is we have wiring between the two. And generally speaking when you have a problem with the electrical circuit of the wiper motor you sort of really need to have a look at some of the wiring diagram components. Now, this is where maybe it starts to get a little too advanced for a do-it-yourselfer, but the fact is this, this is what a professional technician would use, would use in order to, to determine if the problem is the switch, the motor, or the wiring. And I'm just, I'll just give you an example of how some faults can occur with the system. So, if you take a look, we have power that comes in and on this particular schematic they show a circuit breaker coming in. Now you might say why would I have a circuit breaker versus a fuse on my wiper motor and you have to understand the difference between the two. A circuit breaker is going to self reset and a fuse is going to blow and then it's going to be have to be replaced in order for it to be uh, serviced again. So if you think about a lot of scenarios that people do, and I'm certainly guilty of this, is you try to do the, uh, the cheat. When you get about three inches of snow on the windshield of the car, you're cold, you're tired, you just want to go home, and you uh, put the key in the ignition, turn the key on, and you go, let me see if I get lucky enough, I can push the snow all off the windshield. And what you get is you get the wiper motor going, Rrr, and then it just stops. And then you go, ah, well, I guess I lost. And you get out and you shovel all the snow off the car and then you turn it back on and the wiper motors work again. Well, that wiper motor, when it just goes up and stops, if that had a fuse, it would blow the fuse. And at that point, the wiper motors would not work again until you replace the fuse. But automotive engineers know that generally you're going to realize what you did. You're going to get out and clean the snow off the windshield. And in that time, the wiper motor is going to self-reset. And then at that point, you can use your wipers again after you clear the majority of the snow off the windshield. So that's why we have a circuit breaker in the circuit. The other thing is, is we have our switch, and then we have our motor. Now, what that's going to do is there's obviously wiring in between the two components. And while this is on in the low speed, the wiper motors are going to circulate back and forth. Now, again, that's going to be on that transmission assembly. I just have this little piece here just going around in a circle so you can see what it does. The wiper motors, if you always wondered why they go back to the off position or known as the park position when you turn them off, is because there's actually a separate circuit inside the wiper motor that even though you turn the switch off, it will always reset the wipers back to that park position. I've seen on some cars where the wiper motors don't park anymore. In other words, you turn off the wiper switch and generally speaking they just turn off at wherever you turn the switch off. That's a problem, okay? A lot of times it's not the fault of the switch, but rather it's actually the park switch, which is built inside the motor and in most cars can't be serviced separately. So that's something you might want to look into. The other thing is, is we'll have on this motor two different speeds. We have a high and a low speed. And um, between the high and low speeds, if we um, do something like if we disable, let's see here, if I disable one of these wires, let's see what I'm going to knock out here, circuit 56. 
what that does is that takes out the low speed and my park, and now I'm just stuck with the high speed. Now, every car is a little different, but the point is, is this is a prime example of a type of fault where somebody might say, oh, I think the switch is bad, or oh, I think the motor's bad, but when in reality, what you have is a wiring fault. And that's why it takes a professional sometimes to make sure that you go back and carefully inspect the system thoroughly to make sure that you find the fault. Um, wiper motors are a little tricky, as you can see, you know, sometimes with an electric motor, we just have two wires, power and ground running to them. But here we have power, ground, intermittent, high speed, park, and low. And uh, so there's far more than just two wires that run to this. And it takes a professional to use a schematic to make sure that the entire circuit's working before they just go ahead and start replacing parts. Okay? So um, let's take a look at some of the cleaning products that we should use when we're cleaning a windshield. When it comes to what you should put on the windshield, um, you have to be careful. The windshield is not just glass, it's actually multiple layers of glass and plastic and UV resistant plastics and all kinds of things like that. Um, generally, for the most part, you're going to want to use a good commercially available windshield washer solvent. Now this is a product that is uh, typically dyed blue. Sometimes they dye it pink or, you know, sometimes it's green depending on the manufacturer. But uh, its main active ingredient is uh, methanol. And it's a very thin alcohol and it's mixed with some distilled water. Now when you mix alcohol and water together, what that does is that lowers the freezing point of the water. If you use just plain water in the washer solvent tank of your vehicle, that's bad. Um, first of all, plain water by itself isn't really going to cut through anything that's bonded to the windshield like dead bugs or grease or road grime. The other thing is, is that when it does go below freezing, you run the danger of actually freezing that entire bottle solid. Now, if it freezes solid, not only will you not have any washer fluid, but you're probably going to break some things. If you've ever done the whole glass jar in the freezer trick, um, you know that the water will expand equally in all directions and actually cause the glass to shatter. Even though the casing of the washer solvent tank may be plastic, it's not a super flexible plastic. It's, it's kind of ruggedized a little bit so that way it can withstand the harshness of the methanol without disintegrating over time. So if you put just plain water in there, you're going to run the risk of cracking that tank, at which point then when you realize what you've done, you're going to go probably try to put some regular washer fluid in there and it's all going to leak out all over the place. The other thing is, is that we'll take a look at it back on the car, but there's a small electric pump, plastic electric pump, that's actually immersed in the methanol mixture. And if that freezes, there's a good chance that, that pump is going to burn out and fail, in which case you also don't have any washer fluid coming up on your windows. So always make sure that you use just plain old washer solvent, nothing else. I've seen people try to make their own concoctions and it just it doesn't work well. You should never put anything like antifreeze, which eats paint. Um, I've seen people try to add uh, ammonia because it doesn't freeze. That actually destroys the finish of the car and actually can destroy the finish of the windshield as well. On top of the fact that it smells terrible and if you happen to get any on you while you were driving, if you had your window rolled down, it would be extremely painful. Um, so please, just make sure you always use a commercially available washer solvent uh, labeled as such. And of course, make sure you store it in the container with the child resistant cap. Uh, this could look like some type of flavored fruit drink for somebody if they couldn't read if they were a child and we wouldn't want them to ingest this. Um, it can cause blindness if you drink this. Um, so that's my story on that. The next thing we have is we have some commercially available cleaning products specifically made for car windows. Now, if you remember back from my detailing show, I talked about how you really shouldn't use household cleaning products to clean parts of the car. And car windows are nothing like the windows in a house. If you break a window in a house, it just breaks. It shatters into large shards of glass. Automotive windows are actually made out of several laminated layers of glass and plastic. They're sort of sandwiched together and they're bonded. Now the reason why we do that is because it's considered safety glass. And what makes it safety glass is that first of all, it's very structural. In a lot of cars, the actual windshield is the part of the actual cabin structure that keeps the car together. 
Um, it's not bulletproof or anything like that, but it's very rigid. It's actually quite hard to break. If the vehicle does encounter a, an accident and the windshield cracks, instead of large, plastic, uh, large shards of glass breaking away um, that would hurt somebody, they actually stay kind of like in a safety net of expandable plastic. And that's why it's extremely difficult to break a car windshield. Um, you literally have to really try very hard to actually poke a hole through a car windshield. They're extremely, extremely strong. And they do that for a couple reasons. One is in the event of an accident, we don't want the glass to come back into the passenger compartment. And two, in the event of an accident, we don't want the glass to fly everywhere onto everybody else in the accident. So it's, it acts like a safety net. Because of that, the materials that you have to use is you should use a good commercially available product made specifically for automotive glass. And that's because it won't scratch the glass, it's not too harsh. Um, this particular product is safe to use on tinted surfaces as well. And it comes in wipes and a spray, which is great. And generally, for the most part, that's generally what you're going to have to do if you're going to um, try to keep your windshield clean. If you need to go another step further, and you want to try to make something yourself, um, while I talked about not using household products, there are some actual good methods to actually make your own windshield cleaner, which is a safe, plastic safe product. In fact, you could probably use this for some computer screens or LCD screens. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to take an empty spray bottle, a clean spray bottle, one that wasn't used for some other product, and you're going to take some distilled water. And you have to use distilled water as opposed to mineral water because a lot of the debris on the windshield is actually minerals. Um, if you expose the windshield to, uh, say, like a lawn sprinkler and then you let it sit in the sun, as that water evaporates, it's going to leave little teeny tiny white splotches. And what that is is that's the calcium residue left over from the ground water system as it evaporated on the windshield. That can be extremely hard to clean off once it's embedded into the windshield. So we're going to use distilled water because it doesn't have any calcium. So you're going to take about one part of our distilled water. And I'm going to add just 10 ounces of that. OK. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add one part of white vinegar. Now what the white vinegar is going to do is the white vinegar is also purified and distilled so it doesn't have anything in it that's going to leave a residue behind. But this is really going to help cut through any type of grime or oils that are accumulated on the glass. So we'll add five ounces of that. Okay. And then the last part to my formula is I'm going to take some 91% isopropyl alcohol. And what this is going to do is this is going to mix with everything and help it evaporate quickly so it doesn't dry and leave streaks behind. And I'm going to add another five ounces of this. All right, mix that together. And uh, what I have when I'm all done with this is I have a pretty good cleaning solution and plenty of it that I can use. It's environmentally safe. It doesn't smell particularly bad. It doesn't smell particularly good either. But the fact is, is it's completely safe from plastics. All right. When it comes to cleaning, when it comes to cleaning the windshield, what you're going to want to do is you're always going to want to use a cleaning cloth that's soft and or a glass mitt or glove or something like that. And these are really going to help also make sure that you don't leave any streaks or anything like that behind. The problem with some of the commercially available glass cleaners that you might find in the supermarket is that if you notice the difference between my homemade product and their product is probably the coloring. Now, why they would dye those products a specific color might be their own trade secret. But the fact is, is that dye and the soaps and that type of things that they put in it actually are what leave the streaks on the windshield. And if you're detailing a car for a show, you really don't want anything left behind. So this works really well. We might use this a little bit later on our car behind us when we start to uh, do some cleaning. If you have to do something heavier duty, there are commercially available windshield cleaners and strippers, which are going to really actually compound the glass. They're going to lift 
everything out of the glass. Any type of oil that's embedded, um, any type of sap or things like that that are really stuck to the windshield surface, this will lift it off. I will say one exception to my rule, which I found over time, is that the ceramic cooktop cleaner, which you can buy at most supermarkets, does a fantastic job on automotive glass. It really does a good job. It's almost as good as the commercial windshield stripper products, um, and a little bit goes a long way. The only thing you have to be careful about with both of these is you want to make sure that you only get them on the windshield, not elsewhere on the finish of the car, not on the rubber trim around the windshield, because they will kind of leave that white residue behind. All right, so that's the heavier duty stuff. If you really have something heavy duty, you can actually use a razor blade, okay? Now you can safely use a razor blade on automotive glass given that you have thoroughly washed the windshield beforehand. The only time I've ever seen windshields scratch, get scratched by razor blades, let me peel this off here, is when the metal edge of the blade has grit trapped underneath it. And that's why it's important to make sure that you actually wash the windshield thoroughly with one of the cleaning products before you attempt to even scrape anything off of it that might be stuck to it. If you have sand particles, grit, anything like that trapped underneath the blade, it will at that point scratch the windshield and you don't want that to happen. Okay, so if you do happen to have a windshield scratch, we can actually still fix that as well. <clears throat> there is a product called cerium oxide, which is a type of ceramic compound. It's a very fine dust. You shouldn't breathe it. It comes in a small package like this. It's a powder. And what I have here is a small cup filled with distilled water and a buffing pad. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this up as a slurry, and then I'm going to hook it up to an electric drill, and I can actually use that to polish the scratch out of the windshield. Now this is something that is not a five minute job. If you have a scratch in the windshield, say from a wiper blade or something like that, it may take you hours to actually polish that scratch out of the windshield. But the fact is, is aside from replacing the windshield, it's pretty much the only thing we can do. So what I'm gonna do is take my pad out here and put this in the chuck of my drill. Okay, and I'm going to take some of my cerium oxide powder and pour it in here. Once I get this mixed up, what I'll have is what's known as a slurry. Now the trick is with cerium oxide uh, abrasives is you have to keep them wet while you're working. So it's a good idea to constantly dip this foam pad back into the reservoir with the cerium oxide. It's also a good idea to have something like a hose on hand, keep the windshield a little wet while you're working. We you do not want this to dry out. If this dries out while you're working with it, it's going to actually start to burn the surface of the windshield. It's sort of like a, a buffer or polisher but it's made specifically for glass. You can look at the size of this and versus the size of the windshield, and generally you don't do the entire windshield with this product. You just do it in one small spot where you have a scratch. Okay, well, I think that pretty much covers uh, taking care of the windshield. Let's move this out of the way and we'll take a look at some of the systems on the car. We're back over at the vehicle and we're gonna take a look at some of the components of the wiper washer system and the windshield. Now, um, over here on this side of the windshield, I, it's not clean, and this side I cleaned it a little bit, but there's still, uh, there's still some debris. Uh, I don't know what this is, if it's a, a pit or if it's um, some road grime that's stuck on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some of my homemade windshield cleaner and hit that right there and just take a soft, wet paper towel, see if I can get that to come off there. and. I'll wipe that off with a microfiber towel. And it looks like that material is still on there. And so what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna actually hit it with a little bit of the um, windshield cleaner compound. 
And it's important also, uh, I've seen people ruin windshields by trying to clean them with things like Brillo pads or steel wool or even those, um, those Scotch-Brite pads that you may have seen that you can kind of use sometimes to clean Teflon. You don't want to use them on a windshield. Um, again, you want to make sure that the windshield has been pre-cleaned to get all the grit off it before you attempt to clean it. And then, you know, uh, just use something that's not abrasive on the, uh, on the surface here. So I'll just put a little bit on my sponge, just a drop. And we'll just rub this in. Bring this out. And it looks like that is still on the windshield. So let me hit it, dry it off here. Yep, that's still definitely on the windshield. Now I'm starting to look at that and I'm starting to think that that's actually probably a pit in the glass, at which point, you know, nothing's going to get that out. So it's important though to um, not go crazy when you find something in the windshield, especially if it's in your field of vision, because you might actually be trying to clean something that really can't be cleaned. Now, just for argument's sake, what I think I might do is um, just wipe this one more time. But I'm pretty sure at this point that that little piece right there is actually a nick in the windshield. Now there are glass places that you can take your vehicle to that might be able to fix that or if there's an actual crack in the windshield. But generally that's beyond do-it-yourselfers or even just a general repair shop. That's specifically somebody that's going to work with windshields for a living. And yeah, I'm looking at that and that's, that's definitely in the glass. So that's not going to come out. And the other rule is if you can catch it with your fingernail, which I can feel this just with the ridge of my fingernail, it's probably too deep to even polish out. So this is going to have to be repaired or if it was severe enough, we'd actually have to replace the windshield. And that's beyond my abilities here at the shop. Um, again, at that point, I would take that specifically to somebody else to have that done. But that being said, we take a look here at the wipers. And typically what happens with the windshield wipers over time is that the actual wiper itself right here, the blade, because it's always in one position pressed against the windshield, it actually starts to lose some of its flex that suspension, it's not so good. And actually the edge of this guy is kind of rough. One of the things that we can do is again, I can take a damp paper towel with my cleaning solution and I can just wipe this across the edge of the wiper blade. And what that'll do is that'll get most of the debris off of the wiper blade over time right there. And that'll help keep the blades a little, a little bit cleaner, but eventually they need to be replaced. When it comes to replacing the wiper blade, uh, a couple things you want to do is, first of all, um, if eventually the wiper blade can't be cleaned anymore and you've cleaned your windshield and it's still uh, kind of not doing a great job, it's time to change the wiper blades. Now, when it comes to changing the wiper blades, it's important to make sure that you buy the correct size wiper blade. And generally, wiper blades come in inches. Sometimes they're rated in millimeters. Um, and a lot of times, there's a catalog that you can look at that actually has the uh, correct size and application for your vehicle. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to put on a wiper blade that's so big. Um, ideally, you might think that putting on a very large wiper blade might be a great idea. But the fact is, what you might find is that eventually, that the wiper blade, when it comes up, it actually hits, starts, you know, goes off the windshield, hits some of the components uh, of the windshield frame and things like that. That in turn is going to actually bend the wiper arm, and we'll take those off in a second. So when it comes to replacing them, one tip that I've learned over time is generally you don't need any tools. You just need to use your fingers. And when you change the wiper blade, 
Um, if you don't have the other wiper blade ready to go, you're going to take this wiper blade off. And the way that you do that is by compressing a clip. Let's see if I can get it on the camera there. There's a clip right there on the underside of the blade. And what that does is when you squeeze that, that's a release tab that's going to allow it to come off that hook end of the wiper arm and then you can take it off. The other thing which I've learned, and I've learned this the hard way in life, is that when you have the wiper arm up, don't ever walk away from this. Um, because what happens is, is there's a spring in the wiper arm and if this comes down against the windshield hard, it will actually crack and damage the windshield. So you always want to make sure that while you have this, you're getting your other wiper blade ready, you always lay these back down. Um, you don't want to smash and damage the windshield. So I'm going to take my new wiper blade right here and position this on. And again, I don't need any tools to do this. I just pull this up, give this a good tug, you'll hear it click, and then there's my new blade to go back on. Now, again, before I would install my new wiper blades, I would make sure that I cleaned everything. I'd make sure I'd wipe this area off down here very nicely so that way I didn't have any fresh grit or anything like that to damage my wiper blades with. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to start to get inside the system. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop the hood up and then we're going to actually take the wiper arms off and start to remove some of the cowling underneath here to get to the wiper motor and the cabin air filter. What we're going to do now is we're going to remove the wiper arms and that's because we want to get down into this cowl area for two reasons. I want to show you the wiper motor and transmission and also uh, the component called the cabin air filter. Um, and that's typically how we get to it behind the cowl. So to take the wiper arms off, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to pop off these black protective covers and uh, just pop this off with a screwdriver here. Guy comes off like that and pop the other one off here like that. You don't want to lose them. And this is one of those classic uh, examples where it's a bad idea to start to lay tools right here on the cowl area because we're going to be taking that off. We don't want those components to uh, fall down inside the cowl area and jam up some of the drainage that's uh, going on in there. So once I get them off, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a socket and a ratchet to remove this wiper arm. nut right there. I'm going to do this one. Okay. And now I'm going to take off these wiper arms. Now you got to remember this is a spring-loaded arm. So right now the arm is kind of pivoting. It's trying to push against the windshield and also push against the stud of the uh, wiper transmission. So I'm going to pick this up and carefully clear this. Try to see if I can move this back and forth. And I can just lift that off there like that. Now you want to be careful because the spring on the inside of the wiper arm is actually very strong. So I want to make sure this doesn't come back and smack in the hand or anything. And I want to point out something here that, that's, uh, that's often a problem for a lot of people with wiper systems, is you'll see these small flutes on the inside here of this wiper arm. Now this wiper arm is made out of cast aluminum, and the stud on the wiper transmission is actually made out of steel. Now again, this is another safety measure to make sure that we don't burn out the wiper motor if we accidentally stall this whole system with the big pile of snow. But what can happen is, is you'll hear the wiper motor moving and the wiper arms are not moving. And what happens is, is those nuts, which I just removed, loosen up over time and the teeth here can strip out. Um, sometimes the teeth actually aren't stripped, but rather they just, the nuts got loose and what happens is, is these flutes get kind of impacted with the uh, aluminum shavings. And then at that point what you can do is you can actually take a pick and actually make sure that these flutes are all clean. You can take a small wire brush and actually just 
clean these little flutes out to make sure that they're clean. And that way, when you go to put the wiper arm back on, you make sure that it has a good positive engagement with that spline back on the wiper transmission. So that happens occasionally. Now to get that arm out, what I'm going to have to do is put the hood down and then lift this arm up and pop that off like that. So now my car suddenly doesn't have windshield wipers anymore. Once I have those out of the way, I'm now able to remove on this particular vehicle, this rubber seal, which acts as a gasket to keep some of the water out of this area called the rain tray. Um, it's important to remember that when it rains um, and the car is parked, water is going to roll down the windshield and go into the system. So if, if at this point I see any kind of leaves or trash or anything like that blocking any of the drain holes, now is a good time to make sure that they're cleaned out. If they clog up, what can happen is, is that ice, snow, or um, other contaminants can, can build up in the system and actually cause a blockage and actually cause the rainwater to go elsewhere other than the drains, in which case it might actually come under the floor of your feet inside the car. Once we take this cowl out, we'll be able to see really how the water actually is directed through this gutter system down outside the car. Just lift this piece out. And that comes out in one piece like that. Now on some vehicles, that cowl is held in place by screws and clips and things like that. And here, what I can actually see is uh, we see the lip, which is the end of the windshield where it runs down against the body of the car. There's a seal behind that to keep water out. But I can also see other things like this. This right here, this is the car's uh, processor. That's the computer for the car where it happens to be located in this vehicle. It might seem kind of crazy to stick a computer in an area where it's going to get rained on a whole lot, but the fact is that's why you have that plastic cover on there. And that computer, just like your home computer, gets hot. So here it's got lots of airflow. Um, it's not exactly exposed to engine heat, and uh, that works out really well. So at this point, I'm going to walk around the other side and show you that cabin air filter, and we'll take a look also at the uh, washer bottle. All right, so now that we've got the cowl taken out, um, we can clearly see our cabin air filter, which I've talked about before, but I haven't really shown you how to change it. So I think now is a good time to show uh, what's involved with that. Now, you got to remember that we have all this trash that falls down here, leaves, debris, and anything that kind of slides down the windshield when you're parked under a tree is going to wind up down in here. And the fact is, is, is all of this debris, these pine needles and things like that, they're going to build up in here over time, especially if you live in an area where you're under a tree. Um, the car's parked under a tree typically. is You're, you're going to get a lot of debris in there. And now with the cowl taken out, it's a good idea to actually get a shop vac and vacuum that junk out of there. There are drain holes down on the inside here, and you want to make sure that they're clear um, because, again, if the water fills up in that tray area, it's going to find its way probably inside the passenger compartment under your feet and damage some components. But the cabin air filter on this particular vehicle, it snaps out of a frame and it lifts out like this, and um, this one actually, it's, it's uh, got charcoal built into it, and uh, the charcoal helps with some of the uh, odors that may come in, and then it has a reusable outer plastic frame, and then this part right here, this pleated material, this is what actually traps the debris that would normally come into the passenger compartment of the car. And cabin air filters are a great thing because uh, if you suffer from allergies or anything like that, uh, basically traps all those particles before they come into the passenger compartment. I can see almost straight down into the blower motor housing of our vehicle at this point. So to change this, I'm just going to take my new cabin air filter. And these are generally are under $20. They're not that expensive. And uh, pull this guy out of the packaging here. And on average, you're going to change these probably about once a year or every 15, maybe 20,000 miles. You'd be amazed at the amount of 
debris that blows into these systems while they're functioning. Just carefully clip this back into the frame. Okay, make sure that's all in. And then we're gonna pop this back into the vehicle. All right, and that stems back in, and that's a clean cabin air filter, so they're ready to go for a good long while. But while I have this out, the other thing I want to show you is our washer tank. And I already have this unbolted, but the washer tank itself on this particular vehicle sits up here in the front. And I just wanted to pull this up and show some of the connections on here. Um, first and foremost, we have an electrical connection right here. And what this does is this is a warning circuit to tell you that when you're low on washer fluid. And that's kind of a nice convenience feature that this vehicle has. And then I have an electrical connector right here for my pump motor. This is the pump. I'm going to pull this out of here. Um, this is the little, there's our reservoir. We'll look at that in a second. But this is the little electric pump that is uh, going to actually power the, uh, the washers when you hit the wash button. This is the little electric motor. And this just sits in the, the reservoir. It, it doesn't, uh, doesn't really bolt in there or anything like that. It's just kind of held in by friction through a, a rubber gasket. And then I have a hose right here. And this hose, when it's connected to the motor, runs up through here, through this, um, through this assembly, and then up to the washers on the windshield. So it's literally an electric pump motor that's pumping the, uh, the washer fluid up there. Um, and then if we take a look back here at our reservoir, um, some reservoirs are larger than others. This one happens to hold about three liters of washer fluid. But again, it's just a plastic tank, and sometimes manufacturers will bury this in the fender or someplace that they can fit it. So you want to make sure that you fill it with the proper solvent. Um, this manufacturer actually puts a little nice little basket in here to make sure that you don't have any debris that falls into the, uh, the reservoir and jams that pump up while it's operational. Okay. So let's go over and take a look at the other side and we'll take a look at the, uh, the wiper transmission and see how that works. Back at the wiper motor, what we have is our motor is tucked way in the back there. But what we'll be able to see is that the linkage bars, how that motion actually works. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this on and I added a piece of blue tape here to kind of simulate what that wiper arm would be um, in terms of, of how that, that motion's gonna occur. So let me turn this on and we'll take a look at it. All right, and here, right down in there, I'll make sure my fingers are clear, we can see the uh, wiper motor arm turning and we can see that there's linkage on either side and that's moving both of those uh, wiper studs back and forth at that point. And um, the whole unit is just bolted in place with three, three bolts. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, while there's no problem with this, I wanna show what's involved with taking one of these units out. And, um, Let's do that. And again, at this point, I really want to make sure I don't drop any hardware down through those drain holes in the body. They will get lost forever.
And it's also important to note at this time too that since I am working so close to the edge of the windshield, I really want to make sure I don't bump anything while I'm taking this wiper motor out because I don't want to crack the windshield. It's very fragile on the edges. And lift our motor out. Let's see if I can unplug it. Small screwdriver. There we go. All right. So now, uh, once that piece is off, um, here's my whole wiper motor. And uh, the wiper motor itself can actually unbolt from this component, which is, this is the wiper transmission, which you heard me talk about earlier. Um, there's two crossbars right here. And these can actually also be interchanged. They can, they can be taken off and replaced if they have to be. Um, they're just held on with these uh, kind of pop type, almost like, almost like a rivet kind of cap that holds it on place. Um, on the back side, we can see our motor. And again, on the inside here, we have our park mechanism and uh, some of the electronics to actually make the motor go uh, at uh, different speeds and that sort of thing. Oh, I thought you meant stop. So, at this point, what I'm going to do is put this all back together and make sure it all works. And I'm just putting this wiper motor back in, making sure that all of the bolt holes line up before I tighten everything down. This is one of those times when you don't want to put one bolt in and tighten it down and then find out that the other two don't line up.
Lay my cowl back on. Now, one of the things that you also want to make sure that you're careful about is putting the wiper arms back in the position they were in. Because this is fluted, it can actually mount in a couple different angles. And you want to make sure that the wiper blade isn't too high or too low because when the wipers move, we want to make sure that they don't overextend and hit any of the windshield frame or anything like that. So make sure that that's locked into the right notch where it belongs. back on. Alright, that should be it. Let's put the hood down and make sure everything works. Make sure I didn't leave anything out of there. Yep. Looks like everything works. Gotta replace that other wiper blade. I'm Dan Reed. Thanks for watching Car Corner. Drive safely. First and foremost, we have an electrical connection right here. And what this does is this is a warning circuit to tell you that when you're low on washer fluid. And that's kind of a nice convenience feature that this vehicle has. 